Welcome back to the wizard shop. We have a running engine, the top end, everything's done on the car. Now it's time for phase two. Let's get started. You guys recently seen a video on this 1978 308 GTB. And Danielson has gone through and converted this thing to individual throttle bodies, fuel injection with electromotive. Everything runs just fine. We are pretty much done with the engine except for dyno tuning and things of that nature. But just like I mentioned in the last video, even when Freddie from Tavares had this car in Car Trek, the clutch was out on it. I don't know, they kind of nursed it around to get filming done. But it has always had a bad clutch. But in my mind, I thought, that doesn't matter until the engine is where I want it. And now the engine is there. It's time to move on to the clutch. Let's head on to the back of the car. So most cars is a big job to do a clutch, especially on like on a C6 Corvette or something. The transmission, transaxle, a lot of whole things has to come out. It doesn't matter if it's a front wheel drive car, or rear wheel drive car, as just in this picture here. The transmission in one form or another has to come out to get to the clutch. But this is kind of a rare bird. The 308 actually did something right. Ferrari did something right. Neither the engine or the transmission has to come out of the car to do a clutch. Let's take a look. I'll get this thing raised in the air. So you've been having some fun with this 308, huh? Oh, definitely. Doing some Ferrari work. Really happy with what you did on the engine. It turned out very nice, but we definitely had to get the, the clutch taken care of. I watched him take the bell housing and stuff out. It was so strange because for so many years I've seen transmissions come out. And it's usually through the bottom or through the side or something like that. But through the wheel well, we can do the clutch. Let's take a look at it. So here we can see the back of the engine. The flywheel is actually out. We're going to do a rear main seal while we're here, even though it's not leaking. But the transmission is to the side, isn't it, Daniel? Uh, yes. It's actually this shaft right here goes into the gearbox. That's where it transfers the power into the gearbox. Isn't the transmission and the engine is kind of like the same casting on this? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. They're, yeah, it's all one piece and they're connected by that intermediate plate right where the um, bolts are right there. You can see right next to the crankshaft. Right in here? Yeah, those bolts right there. Yeah. The whole plate comes off and you can access everything. That's pretty cool. But as you can see, we took the wheel liner out, actually Daniel did, and everything is right here. So that's pretty much what went on in there. We're going to show you the parts here in a minute, but let's move to the other side of the car to another really great thing that Ferrari did with the 308. So with the 348, the 355 is engine out to do timing belts. The yes. 360, you can take the seats out. There's an access panel. But this one's even easier than all of those. You take the wheel off and the little liner. Here's the front of our engine. Here's the timing covers, the timing belt on each side. As you can see, it is so easy to get to. There's no cursing involved. You don't get mad. You see we added an auction sensor here for the engine. Also, there's a tone ring for the crank sensor. That's how the ECM is able to see the engines turning and the timing and everything. And this is how it measures the fuel ratio with the, the sensor. But the main thing here is how easy on either side of the car in the rear that you can service this engine without pulling any major components out. No transmissions out, no engines out. It's very, very easy to maintain. I've actually got questions over the years where people are not familiar with any of the exotic cars and they say, oh, those Ferraris are so hard to work on. But they're not, are they? Not really. I they prefer them over the Lamborghinis. Yeah, I prefer them really of any other car. They're designed to be worked on. You can see here that they were thinking about that when they built the car. But the next step we're going to do is LS swap it, Daniel. No. No? No, we're not going to do that. Bad wizard. Bad, Bad wizard. wizard. Okay, okay, we're not going to LS swap it. No, never. We're not going to do that. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I bought this car. I was thinking about different Ferraris I could purchase, and this came up. It just happened to be a really good deal, and this timing belt service and the clutch sold me on the car. I can maintain this, or Daniel can maintain this, and we're not throwing wrenches and so angry. You're not taking the engine out every time something's wrong or something needs to be serviced. It's very, very simple. 
So as you can see, we have everything on these tables. Daniel has everything laid out. This is the bell housing that mounts to the back of the engine. And how does it get power from the engine to the transmission, which sits right beside the engine? Some vehicles use chains, actually a chain drive, but this is a gear drive. Power goes through the clutch to this shaft. It moves through a gear set down through here and through this hole into the transmission shaft. And these are the three gears here, Daniel? Yes. So here you can see the little gear case, and this one's the top one, Daniel? Yes, that's the one coming out of the engine. This is your connecting gear, and then this is the one going to the transmission shaft or input shaft. Okay. So it's kind of a sideways way to get power from the engine to the transmission. And here I am knocking everything over for you. Do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> no. So here you can see I'm spinning the engine. Here's the intermediate and the transmission shaft pokes through there. Here's the flywheel and Daniel cleaned it up, scuffed it up or whatever. It's not cracked. It's not really overheated or anything. It did get hot. You can tell it got hot, but it's definitely going to be reusable. It's nice and flat. Everything's good on it. Here's our old clutch disc. Daniel showed me that it was almost to the rivets here. And you mentioned was something about adjustments weren't done. Yeah, it's just as, as it's been used, uh, I probably could, could have used an adjustment here and there and they never did. They just kept driving it while it was slipping. Um, and it also sustained pretty bad damage out here, here on this side. You can see there's multiple cracks and missing chunks. Oh yeah. So it would have grenaded as soon as we put it on the dynode. Mm -hmm. There's the pressure plate, which is pretty bad looking. So here is the pilot bearing from the flywheel. Actually kind of fits down in there. Got that pulled out. We got a new one ordered. Also a new rear main seal, like I mentioned. This was definitely toast. So here we have a new release bearing. This is a kit I ordered from my supplier, AMH Exotics. There's some O-rings. Here's a new pressure plate. Nice and shiny and new. Nice new spring fingers there, clutch fingers. And here's our clutch disc. You can see that the rivets are deep inset because it's not worn so bad. And look how thick it is. It's almost twice as thick as the old one. Here's the old one to compare. Fifty to eighty percent thickness increase, I would say. And one of the final things we're going to conquer while it's all apart is the alternator is not charging. It was never charging when we got it. And you're thinking it just had oil all over it? And yeah, it was definitely soaked in oil, so I cleaned it up and uh, I'm going to take it over and get it tested to make sure that it's working properly. If not, we'll go from there. If anything, I'm going to try to replace the voltage regulator here and the brushes inside and see if that might bring it back to life. These are like $800 or a grand. If I can make this one work again, I'll do that before I spend the money. If I have to, I have to, but might as well try to make this one work. And it is the Bosch alternator originally like it was when it was new. This probably is the original alternator. Look at this tiny belt, guys. It's like a rubber band. But that's how they are. Look at the little pulley. Tiny little thing. Before we take this thing out on the road and really have fun with it, we're also making sure other things are safe as well. And you mentioned what, the brakes felt weird or something? Yeah, every time you turn, you feel that you lose your brake pedal. After you pump it up, it comes back. So we, you know, I noticed that there was a lot of lateral run out on the rotor, so mm -hmm. that's why I turned them. Um, and then, you know, worked the, I saw that the shims on the actual uh, caliper were installed incorrectly, pushing mm. the caliper a little bit uh, askew. Okay. Right? Um, and then the bearings were bad. Oh, the bearings are bad. There's a lot of play that would also cause that mm -hmm. problem by pushing the pads. So he's got all new bearings, he's got the shim set up correctly, got the pads cleaned off, and we use our Ranger products, our bin pack products, brake lathe back there, resurface these rotors, and they look nice and neat. Everything else looks pretty good in here, like it's got the original Coney shocks and the... Yeah. Uh, no, I checked the whole suspension and everything is tight. Nothing loose, nothing rattling, no knocking. Very good. Let's go check out the other side.
Same situation here, huh? The bearings and everything was the same deal, huh? Yep. Yeah, the bearings were worn, and then also not as much, but pretty bad lateral run out on this on this rotor. And then the shims were fine on this one. It looks like somebody just messed it up on that side. Okay. And you can see the battery through here. Pretty easy to get to. It's, it's done through the top. You open the, the front frunk or the trunk, whatever you want to call it. But you can see that is where the battery is located on this car. And the steering rack is right here is actually very easy. You changed one out on the other 308. Yeah. And it was like in an hour or less, you were like. Chow. Yeah. Yeah, probably a little bit more just because of the, you know, swapping some parts over. But that's about it. Not bad at all. Probably one of the easiest that I've ever done. Yeah. No well, power steering. Yeah, no power steering. Easy. Yeah, it makes it easy. So in our previous video, you saw this thing run. You saw what we've done to the throttle bodies. Daniel's got everything all lined up and wired up. And you think it's more horsepower? I think so. I think it's definitely going to be a gain. 20 to 40, maybe? I hope so. We'll see what a tuner can do when they get it dialed in. Everything can get it just perfect. Yeah, I wish it was running before so we could get it on a dyno, get a comparison. But unfortunately, you know, this thing was barely running. It was, it was running really bad when it came in. When I first drove this car in and pulled it in, it actually sounded like a Subaru. Like <laughs> It's like all the cylinders weren't firing. It sounded really bad. The carburetors were the problem. If anyone out there actually has one of these that has the original large square air cleaner and you don't need it anymore, get in contact with my email address through the website and see if what you might want for it or you want to trade out some other parts I have distributor what is we got the distributors back there don't we huh i believe so yeah yeah a bunch of extra parts and the weber car carburetors as well yep i don't need those anymore do some trading swapping around maybe we can work something out but the timing belt service is done the conversion is done engine is serviced everything's ready we have an oil change to do don't we yep as soon as the oil filter comes in we'll uh, get that done get that done, get the clutch back together, and then we can at least do a couple quick road tests to see how it's doing. And yeah. then, it'll, then it'll be time to take it and get it dyno tuned so that at all RPMs, all power levels, everything is where it's supposed to be with fuel ratio and everything. If you don't do that, you could, you could do damage, huh? Yeah, you can definitely melt the engine. Yeah. Or just from knocking, it'll throw a rod out the side. Yeah, we don't need that. Then we might LS swap it. No, we're not going to LS swap this wizard. <laughs> okay. Maybe we could do a Honda in here. No, that's been done. It's been done? Yeah, we can't copy. Maybe EcoBoost. Only if it blows up. Only, Only. if it blows up. We'll see Beyond about repair. that. I don't want it to blow up. I hope it doesn't. I don't want it to. So the reason why we didn't really address much of anything else, we started with the engine because it is the big ticket item on this car. Depending on the miles, or it could be ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for another engine. I wanted to make sure that the engine was worth using before I threw money into clutches and brakes and a whole bunch of other things. But we discovered it runs perfect. It is a happy engine. Then it's time to start buying the other stuff, which is what we're doing now. It would have been easy to say the clutch is out. Let's go ahead and put one on and get it done, so that when we fix the engine, it'll be ready to go. But that's kind of a bad call. I've seen people do that with cars. They buy project cars and they buy a bunch of the smaller menial items that are cheaper to find out that the engine's toast. And then they have to sacrifice and sell off all the parts they bought at a discount just to get them gone and they lose money because the car is no longer worth messing with. First discover, is the engine, is it worth fixing? Is it gonna work for you? Then move on to the other stuff. The interior is nice. It's been redone by Low and Upholstery. My guy is actually retired. His business doesn't exist anymore as far as a brick and mortar store. But he's still on the side, works for me and Hoovy and a few other people that were some of his good customers that bring him in a lot of money. So I can still utilize his services even though he's no longer open to the public. He's done the seats, he did the partial shelf, the headliner, the, the dash, the door panels, all that stuff. He did a very, very good job. We also changed over the old Euro plastic fuses that cause a lot of trouble in these cars to the Birdman fuses, which is, that's what it's called. His website is Birdman 308. It converts to all glass fuses. We did the same on the other 308 as well. And it solves a lot of electrical problems. Everything started really working a lot better electrically 
when we did the fuse box conversion. But none of that was done until we knew the engine was good. So we'll get this clutch back together, finish up on the front end, and then it'll be time for some initial road tests, and we'll get you guys a video on that as well. If you're curious what kind of tools that I've used, Daniel's son has used to work on this 308, check my Amazon affiliates link in the description below. We get a small cut, we we'll really appreciate it. Make sure to hit the subscribe button because there's many more cool videos to come. Thanks for watching.